Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm super excited to welcome my Tilly today. You have done some amazing work. I remember I saw how this happened and when you were raising and now it's a $10 million fund. Oh my God, this is first of all, huge, huge for Southeast Asian women, people like us. We have no representation in venture capital community as such. And you have such amazing backers of Southeast Asian women LPs. So this is huge. So tell me about how it all started and um, how this the how the fund came in fruition? Yeah, sure. Um, honestly, first of all, Gayatri, I am thrilled to be here and to be speaking with you. I know this has been a long time in coming, and I am truly honored as well and delighted to speak with you. Uh, I am honestly, in all sincerity, a uh, very non-traditional venture capitalist, almost an accidental venture capitalist, uh, without sort of the cliche that that presents in the sense that you know, I spent 25 plus years working in corporate and nonprofit sectors. I came to this country as an immigrant grad student for a PhD program in physics and electrical engineering from India when I was barely 21 years old, came you know by myself and this was late 1989, um, so that dates me, but there was no network of, I mean, I barely knew anyone that looked like me. I didn't even know what I didn't know. I didn't even know that, you know, one needed a network or anything of that sort. It was hard enough being a female in tech. I remember I came to Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, all the way from Mumbai. And um, it was shocking to me, uh, you know, how we had, there was no internet either, right? All our information about the U.S. came from going to the U.S. Embassy and, you know, the USIS and pouring through books and pictures and so on. And then, you know, I come here and I had people who would stop me as I walked to the university or walked to class, asking me if uh, where I came from and if I said India, they say, oh, do you eat monkey brains? And it baffled me, you know, what the heck? It is because they explained, yes, they, Indiana Jones is where their notion of India came from. They would be shocked that I spoke English and that I could converse in English fluently. I didn't tell them that, you know, I only thought in English. My thinking process was always in English, you know, all through my growing years. But, you know, that's sort of the times that I came to this country, started my career in tech, spent the first, I would say 15 years, started in research, in semiconductor research, transition to development and then product management and so on. And then I went and did a, 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 um, a couple of very interesting, uh, what I would call non-profit and not-for-profit stints where I went and led large, built to scale, venture philanthropy firms. 2006, I decided to embark on my entrepreneurial journey, became a tech entrepreneur. Uh, no one looked remotely like me, neither founder nor funder. Again, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I, that was not even something I thought was important. Yeah. I thought, you know, first principles, right? I'm going to, I, I have the background, I have the chops, I'm going, I, I, I know the problem I'm solving. I built a team, raised a seed round, built a product, had customers. So you think I'm checking off yeah. the box sequentially, yeah. right? except when I uh, went to raise my Series A. That was an eye-opening experience. And that's really when the bias hit me very hard. Before that, you encounter bias you know, all the time. But somehow I felt meritocracy always trumped any kind of bias till then, right? Yes, there were you know, um, uh, issues that uh, one encountered, but then I also benefited a lot uh, yep. in terms of finding the right mentors and sponsors uh, in the corporate tech world who, who really propelled me. And I, you know, I, uh, um, I was enjoying my career journey. I, no complaints really, till I, till I encountered the venture ecosystem. 
Yeah. To me, I that, have the same experience, you know. Yeah, this, and this is so fun. I'm sure yeah. so many women will relate to this, right? And yeah. the thing is, you check all the boxes and yet every pitch I went, they would tear me apart, finding a lot more reasons to tell me why I will not succeed versus looking at the facts in front of me and saying there are, there's, there are enough data points here to say she's gotten this far. She could, you know, go much further with backing, right? Long yeah. story short, couldn't raise my Series A. I had to do a fire sale of the assets of the company to another private company and exit. Went back to being an operator. But to me, that was the turning point. Mm. There were two things. Right? I mean, of course, I was frustrated by the whole experience because alongside, I saw so many men with ideas on paper with nothing, nothing at all, no MVP, no traction, nothing raising, had no problems raising whatsoever. First time entrepreneurs too, right? Yeah. And I'm comparing- Silicon Valley culture. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very hostile, very, very hostile. So, you know, I decided, look, I could either, you know, complain and bitch and moan about it. That's not going to help solve yeah. anything. Or I could channel my frustrations into, you know, something more meaningful where I had some control, maybe even if in a small way. So that's when I decided to start my angel investor journey and uh, slowly started to build that expertise. I started first just investing in companies of people that I knew, seeking, of course, as much as possible female you know teams even if they were not founders female founders were still a very very rare breed yeah. right so for me it was important to see that there were women in that company either in the founding team or you know in the early um, early team right and so that's how I started my investor journey that's 15 years ago almost the last seven years uh, uh, or so I, I you know as one gets savvier and one's network expands and so on I became an LP in several sort of more prominent firms so my learning really grew exponentially as part of that process and it was around that time I also became an LP in women-led investment funds like portfolio pipeline angels golden seeds and again these were all sort of organically and I found out they intrigued me the models in, intrigued me and I figured the best way to learn is you know to jump in and become an LP and get your hands dirty so that's what I did and I loved 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 the journey and the and the education most importantly that camaraderie very positive very collegial and collaborative, something I didn't associate with the VC ecosystem at all. It was very refreshing. Here were women, mostly senior operators, largely doing this as a side hustle. So they were not doing this full time, like, you know, me, this is a side hustle, but very, very willing to collaborate, teach each other, to lift each other, and all investing in female founders. It was remarkable for me. I truly, the experience was amazing, I have to say. And I give huge kudos to, you know, um, these trailblazing funds that, you know, uh, started early enough on this journey and inspired people like me, for sure. Yeah. But I'll tell you, for me, the white space that I started to see was lack of representation in these yeah. places. This is Silicon Valley I'm talking about. In my personal network, I3, I knew so many in incredible South Asian women, right? Yeah. I didn't see any of them in these funds and these networks. And so it begged the question, why? And so that's what started. I started to host these chai sessions in my backyard. Oh my and God. As a, the reason I said accidental uh, VC was I wasn't thinking of starting a VC fund at all. That I wasn't sort of passionate about starting a fund at all. I'd be lying if I said that was, you know, my career aspiration. It wasn't. Yeah. But as I started this dialogue, right, with people saying, look, I'm just, I want to share my experiences and see, and I want to learn from you if any of you are doing things like this. And if not, why? Yeah. Because I think, you know, it's time that we women started to put our money where our mouth is, because that's how we change the narrative, right? And so that's really, that was my only goal at that point. But as these chai sessions of 10, 15 people grew to hundreds, the you know, it started to spread, the news started to spread, and people were would just invite themselves. 
I realized there was definitely a product market fit here. Yeah. There was a huge gap that needed to be addressed. And there was this hunger within yeah. this demographic. Here was senior VP, CXO women who had never participated in the venture ecosystem and who were very, very eager. They had built products, services, businesses, but had never invested. So I know that's a long story, long minded answer to what you asked me but to me it was the aha moment saying look here's an opportunity perhaps I can you know pull together all my learnings over the past years and do something where I can truly create impact and my mission at that time was to start the fund so yeah. I started all of these conversations and then realized that there was a community that needed to be first built yeah. because to me it was not just yet yet another venture fund that I was trying to launch I was very clear that I wanted to launch a venture fund solely aimed at this demographic it was also clear that it was a unique demographic that was highly educated fairly senior but had never never invested they were all first-time LPs and here I was, a first time VC as well, right? So how does one build trust? Yeah. And so I felt the community part was very important first. So that's where Nathree.org came into being, you know, built, started to build the community. And as you know, I have two co-founders for the community, Shruti Ramaswamy, who you know as well, um, is my daughter's friend, actually. <laughs> She's a young millennial, but I really wanted the community to be a cross-generational community. I did not want it to be one way. It's all senior women. Yes. Because if we truly aspire to pay it forward and give back, it was important to bring that next generation to the mix, right? And so that's where in my conversations with Shruti, I saw she got excited and she wanted to jump in and help. Uh, she has a full-time job, but, you know, she was willing to. She's that it. iconic. Yeah, iconic. Yes, exactly. And she was featured um, actually um, two months ago on She v Yes, she told me. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, and my second co-founder is a woman. Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly, yeah. you know, bright, driven, very sort of thoughtful, conscientious young young woman. A great co-founder for me for Nitri.org. My second co-founder at Nitri.org is Chitra Naik, who's a seasoned executive, but also taken a step back from active operator roles is on several boards. But this notion of creating a platform for South Asian professional women, where the conversations are all about our professional pursuits and how we can help each other advance professionally, how we can lean in on each other, how we can elevate each other, right? And really sort of put South Asian women on the map. South Asian men, as you know, have done right, rather well for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right? But uh, we are the invisible minority. It's yeah. so interesting, um, Gayatri, and you'll relate to this, right? In all kinds of demographic analysis, whether it is women in VC, whether it is minorities, what have you, women of uh, color report or people of color, everything, South Asians don't figure as a demographic. Yeah, we are just Asian. And you know that our cultural context is fairly unique. We, you know, just sort of putting us into the Asian umbrella doesn't do true justice to this demographic, right? But you talk to most folks and they think South Asian is synonymous with Asian or yeah. Asian American. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's sort of, that's why all of this, and it's been, we launched Nathree.org in 2020, March of 2020. The world changed around us. We didn't anticipate, but I think it was a blessing in disguise. The community has grown to about 2,300 women globally. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, it is, it is all organic. We are all volunteer run effort at Nathree.org. We focus on professional leadership development, getting on boards for the senior women about community and connections, networking, job opportunities it's 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 just thriving then the fund idea of course continued to lurk in the background and after lots of conversations as the community started to grow i had an incredible audience to start dialogue about the need for the fund and again huge pent-up demand so launched yes. the fund march of 2021 we were completely oversubscribed by end of june 
I honestly, I'll tell you, when I launched, talk about imposter syndrome, I had used imposter syndrome because there's no precedence, right, to something yeah. in this. I said 3 million. That was my goal. I remember that. <laughs> yes. I thought if I raise 3 million and we can do a few investments, at least with fund one, maybe I'll get more ambitious with fund two, depending on how things went, right? Mm. But we were oversubscribed. We already have so much interest in fund two again already. You know, I haven't yet um, embarked on fund two, but uh, we have made, so the fund itself was launched March of 2021. We, uh, as, uh, I'm the solo GP. Our thesis is enterprise tech, mm -hmm. software systems, infrastructure. That's the stack we invest in. We don't take a lead role in our investments. Yeah, we co-invest co alongside you know, other top tier VCs. That strategy has worked quite well for us because again, don't have the resources to do that deep dive diligence uh, that a lead investor um, requires, right? This has worked really, really well. Our LPs, 247 of them in the fund, of which 98% are South Asian women. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, and of that, about more than 75% are first-time investors. They've never invested before. And many of them have uh, keep telling me that since then they have been emboldened to make other investments, just directly in companies as well startups, as well as you know in other funds, which is what we want to see happening in the ecosystem. Right? We um, require uh, so we'll do we're stage agnostic. We'll do anywhere from pre-seed all the way to Series D. Uh, we write checks anywhere from 50k to 500k. Our requirement is there has to be a female in a decision-making role in the company before we invest. It doesn't have to be South Asian female. The South Asian focuses on the investor side, at least for fund one. Yeah. Uh, but the, a female has to have a decision-making role, either as a founder, as a, um, part of the executive team, or on the board if it's a later stage company. The good news with later stage companies is almost always a yeah. female in the, on the executive it's already team. big and there's yeah. already executive exactly. team and there's exactly. obviously there will be some female over there yes. but in early stage it's like you and a dog starting a company exactly <laughs> exactly so there we are very very particular that it has to be one of the founders so we've made 13 investments so far uh, with the fund and Dflow has been, you know, terrific overall. I have uh, investment, uh, another um, uh, an invest investing partner, Roli Saxena, who the two of us together make all the investment decisions for the fund. Roli works full time; she's president of Adro, and um, works on the fund with me, only on the investment side. But all the operations, the fundraising, all of that was me. No, that's amazing. First of all, I mean, this is, that's why I said, like, when you, when we chatted about, like, you know, how long the interview you want to make it, I was like, you know, you can make it 30 minutes or you can be like Brad Fell, like Brad <laughs> Fell answered the very first question for an hour. And oh I was my like, God. you I answered did. the very don't first want to be that. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you answered the first question in, in, in almost 20 minutes. And I was like, you know, this is, such an important journey because representation matters one number two is like i experienced the same situation and i came early 2000 as an immigrant and and i feel like nothing has changed and venture yes. capital still remained the same i did not feel there was much of a bias at the tech world when i was working in the corporate world but definitely it's like we need a suffrage movement in the asset allocation space. Yep. This space has been very, very homogeneous. So I so agree with you. And what you have built, it is so necessary because obviously there are so many organizations that are out there focusing on Asian community or Southeast Asian, but there's nothing, there's no focus on women. And I think like, when it comes to women, they're always at the lowest category. Like whenever people are thinking of investing in the black community also, like black men have comparatively done better than black women. Yep. Same situation with Southeast women. One of the thing, uh, Southeast Asian women, one of the thing I wanted to highlight is like, we are no longer considered minorities anymore. And, um, and I, I face that a lot. Um, when I'm raising the fund and, and I obviously understand like people associate that, you know, you guys are doing fairly well. Many of you are highly educated coming from Ivy League backgrounds. What is 
the problem I found is like none of us are involved in the asset allocation space. And that is where things matter. So I would love to know your point of view. Like, how do you think the new generations of founders and funders are navigating this space when you're actually minorities, but we're no longer considered minorities in paper? That's a tough one. And I think um, the best way is to not go solo and in silos. Mm. Because I think it's um, a rolling stone sort of on its own gathers no moss, they right, say, right? It's hard to gather momentum when you are, you know, working in silos, right? And the reason I say that is, uh, I give this classic example. I don't know if you're aware of Thai, the Indus entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. You know, when it first started, which was in the 90s, it, it was a coming together of South Asian, primarily men. There were no women. V slowly now, especially as they're starting to see how popular Netri is getting, they are understanding what, uh, uh, you know, the important role women can play in, in what they're doing as well. And it took them all these years to have a female executive director, which they ah. do now. Yes, but when they started, it was all men. But I'll tell you, Singularly, Thai played a critical role in galvanizing South Asian men within the founder funder community in that and, and sort of making them aware and getting them to dare to dream. If you look at a whole class, for example, Naveen Chadda, I don't know if you know Naveen, yeah, yeah. Mayfield, right? Naveen will tell you that when he first came here, for him, he went to a Thai conference, saw uh, Vinod Khosla on stage. And that was that aha moment for him when he realized, oh goodness, he is a VC. He had never heard VC. I mean, to know first, A, you can be a VC, you can be a successful entrepreneur, you can build companies. For him, it was like, if he can do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Right? Right, and right. so my point being that Thai became that springboard. Mm. where founders came they met other founders they met other funders deals got, got in teams got formed right and so the ecosystem really grew and even today it's a formidable force when it comes to the founder funder ecosystem of south asian men mm. and it's almost still exclusively men even though they are trying hard to be inclusive i think for as women, and it's not just South Asian women, I would say women of color, black women, all of, and even all of the minority. White, white, even including white women. White women, women, including, right? I mean, if you look all race, women in VC, women 2.0, these are all movements, right? Yeah. That help galvanize action. When you start to see that there is a community of folks that you can realize where A, there are predecessors who've been there, you know, both successfully, people who have failed, learned from that, and then embark. You see all of those examples. I think it gives you that courage, that yeah. courage of conviction to say, I really want to do this. And there are others who have done, so I'm going to go make that leap. For me, my first business plan competition my very first pitch as an entrepreneur into, was at women 2.0 and we won that awesome uh, kids woman 2.0 giving up yes and i credit women 2.0 you know i never never thought that i could go stand you know on stage and pitch to thousands of people i'd never done that right i was you know largely pitching to small product teams in companies that I was in. But that gave me that, you know, that, that confidence. And if it were not for Women 2.0, I think, you know, it would have taken me much longer. So I credit Women 2.0 for giving me that platform. So I believe, again, long story short, for minorities in particular, where that um, role modelship doesn't come, say, from home, nobody in yeah. my home was an entrepreneur or a VC, yeah. no, one. no one, right? Yeah. So the role modelship was not coming from home for me. Yeah. It came from that community. So I truly, truly believe Gayatri, this is not lip service. I believe, and clearly I walk the talk with Netri, that we need to create those forums for minorities in particular. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, for me, I started VC. I was like, we hear about male entrepreneurs and funders, um, you know, always on this podcast and they're male, they're male coming from 
uh, different backgrounds, but I don't get to hear from women and minority GPs and LPs. And I was like, you know, a lot of people said that there's so many powerful podcasts. Why you want to start another podcast? I was like, I don't see their presentations. And that's why I started. I'm so seeing- glad you're doing this. <laughs> and we are both. It's on almost like, like therapy. <laughs> yeah. We are both on Transact. It's a simple WhatsApp group, but it's so powerful. Yeah. It is so uplifting. It is so supportive, right? And so collaborative. I, so I do think we need forums like that. Yes. No, I totally agree with you. I think um, I have been on Transact for a long period of time. And so I think it's more than a year right now. And Soraya, Alexis, Heather, when they started it, and it was more like, okay, let's bring people like me who are having similar issues or having similar backgrounds or just emerging managers, women emerging managers. There's not much of a forum or ways for people to come and collaborate. I think this is so important. And um, I totally agree with you. It's I love your wisdom there. I love the fact that you <laughs> share all these tidbits so graciously, so generously. It inspires others to do the same. Yeah. And there are such amazing women. I mean, I'm learning so much from there. I think that I have not learned from the outside areas and these forums are so important. Now, so coming back to to Nathri Future Fund, I would love to know, tell me some of the portfolio companies that you invested and you want to highlight, especially um, on SheVC. And you know, most of the SheVC um, a network, or I'll say the listeners are institutional LPs and obviously um, large banks and wealth management firms. So I would love to know, talk about some of those portfolio companies and how they are doing, especially in this winter. Absolutely. So our first two investments, right after you know our first capital call was closed, came from the Nay3 network which of course was wonderfully gratifying. They're both South Asian female founded companies. WebScale was the first one founded by Sonal Puri. WebScale is a multi-cloud SaaS platform for e-commerce. Sort of, you know, think of Shopify on steroids. They're doing very, very well. We invested in their CDC. The second one was Vendia. We invested in uh, Vendia Series A and then did a follow on Series B just um, wow. last month as well. Vendia was also is also a South Asian female founded company. Shruti Rao is incredible. Was a very senior leader at AWS, and they um, she is building this serverless distributed data and code sharing platform. That's what Vendia is. Then. Um, I won't go into everything. We've invested in a couple of fintech, really interesting, exciting fintech companies. One is Sinkterra, the other is Orem. Orem is an infrastructure play and Sinkterra is more fintech as a service platform. They are doing some groundbreaking work. And then we have SetSail, which is an AI powered sales enablement platform. Another very exciting investment for us is Alchemy which is basically a developer platform for yeah. um, uh, decentralized you know, uh, blockchain applications, right? Uh, it's sort of the AWS, if you will, for lack of better um, explanation for blockchain. Very, very excited. We invested in the Series A. They, they are now beyond unicorn. Yes. <laughs> um, valuation so that is you know incredibly uh, exciting uh, a seed stage investment for us is cash flow at yet another Natri founder um, who is doing embedded financing for SaaS companies very very interesting model again we invested in her seed round she is now you know looking to do um, her next one and you know we hope to be there with her as well. And then our most recent um, two uh, investments are, uh, one is Creatively, which is a job platform for creatives. Um, a serial entrepreneur, founder is a serial entrepreneur, really um, uh, interesting space. This is sort of the future of workspace, if mm-hmm. you will. Yeah. For us. And then um, another one is Noyo, which is an infrastructure company for benefits, sort of connected benefits, network benefits, Um, a female founder, not South Asian, but a female founder uh, there as well. So that's sort of the, you know, breadth of uh, investments, 13 to date. You know, how are they doing? I think the good news is um, most of them are just hunkered down right now. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Clearly, the funding climate is tough. 
yeah. it's changed dramatically just in the last couple of months we all know but i do believe that still um, companies with sound fundamentals companies that are still you know um, poised well growth wise and um, uh, have good product market fit will weather the storm yeah yeah and do again this is always the case down downturn upturn what have you right yeah there is always a market downturn exactly yeah. exactly and though I, and i think you know these are all seasoned founders very sharp founders they'll find ways to pivot and persevere overall i believe so and that's sort of you know and we are there and you know we have 247 lps at uh, the nature futures fund and so my big sort of focus is in working with our portfolio companies to see how our lps can add value mm, right as they you know look to grow right and so uh, and that's sort of our biggest differentiated advantage yes that we offer no i totally agree with you one of the thing that you talked about like when you are investing in a company the company needs to have at least a woman in the decision making role now can you talk a little bit about the investment thesis like are you tech focused or are you a generalist or and what are the other areas that you're looking at especially if some founders are looking at it uh, what kind of checks that they are expecting and i see that you are also investing in pretty late stage growth stage and also at least it's the mess it's a multi stage so we'd love to know all those opportunities yeah sure our thesis actually for fund 1 was fairly simple i looked at our demographic lp demographic as i said 98% are women and you know yeah. generally women tend to have a lower risk profile overall of that of the total 247 lp LPs more than 75% are first time investors so they've never done this before i want them to feel emboldened by this experience such that they will want to do this again and so from that perspective uh, we thought long and hard about the thesis and we said that we that's why we adopted the thesis of co-investing alongside top tier vcs if you look at our, our investments we have invested with sequoia with andreessen with uh, mayfield uh, you know with with pretty much all the top tier funds and yeah. the reason was both first because we have limited resources to do uh, um, due diligence so we piggyback off of these top yeah. tier but also to mitigate risks to certain extent we the other reason the other uh, important aspect of our thesis is we invest um, we are stage agnostic and the reason for not entirely investing and i get a lot of questions around this why a small fund like ours is not doing only seed so we can actually take perhaps a lead uh, investor role board seats and all that honestly that's not the focus right yeah. for us at all for me finding ways for early exits and early returns at yeah. least some part of our investments back to our lps is really important and hence sort of diversifying our portfolio so we include some later stage investments as well and perhaps you know can also do some secondary exits and so on is very important so that our lps will actually see some distribution yeah early yeah. on uh, right and don't have to wait for 10 years for even the first company to you know have some sort of an exit so so you know those sort of are our thesis we plan to do you know about 20 to 25 investments and then have follow on reserves as well uh, us based companies only Mm -hmm. we have decided at least for fund 1 we won't do pure healthcare we'll do digital tech but not pure healthcare because of you know fda Science compliance is, and you yeah, know all right. of that right yeah. yeah so fairly simple thesis yeah no i love that i think that is so important and the idea is like you're doing this at silicon valley like that is the heart of where everything is happening and you have been in that space for so long like you are almost an og in that space and um i feel like do you see there's a shift in the gear because now people can work from anywhere people can build companies from anywhere and there's definitely like i just came from miami yesterday and i can feel the shift like miami is trying to be the next silicon valley yeah. and people ask me like hey why didn't you move to miami and i was like you know i'm from india if i want to stay in a hot weather and not enjoy the four seasons i'll go back to india yeah. so um 
I would love to know your thought process also, like how do you think all this, you know, the newer hubs and also the Midwest, Southwest, all these areas, how they're becoming the next generation, you know, entrepreneur maker, yeah. Oh, I think it's fabulous. I think the VC ecosystem can only benefit overall, yeah. right, from that. Because I think you need this, this ecosystem, which ironically talks about disruption all the time, is the least disrupted of yes. all. Right. Yeah. So I truly think that these, you know, different geographical hubs, this uh, influx of women emerging fund managers, women and, you know, other diverse fund managers now, you know, coming up will all only help this ecosystem get better and thrive overall. So I think it's overall really, really good. No one can deny that. Right. Um, you know, a lot of things with sort of the Silicon Valley mindset, so to speak, that everybody talks about are great, right? Because I, I, to me, what I like about the Silicon Valley mindset is, you know, founders are scrappy, they are passionate, you know, it's infectious almost when you're in the valley, right? That startup culture is infectious. You turn around, you sit in a restaurant, you see people working on napkins and so on. So all of that is infectious. Clearly the pandemic changed a lot of it and it was very hard for if you talk to most vcs and i talked to a lot of my vc friends especially male they say it was very very hard you know they couldn't even understand you know how could they uh, meet with founders and decide things over zoom but guess what they did in fact many of them said that they have done mega deals just over zoom and have still and are still yet to meet founders yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so I think the realization that it can happen and that you don't have to like keep flying and wasting all this time. I, I think it'll bring overall efficiency into the system as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think that is so much required Like, because for a long period of time, entrepreneurs living not in Silicon Valley are missed out. I mean, exactly. we know- exactly. People like Mark Zuckerberg and others, they all shifted to Silicon Valley. Yep. And I don't think in today's uh, world, he he needed that shift. And I remember yep. when I was studying at Harvard, like Harvard iLab was literally built because they felt like there's so many entrepreneurs coming out of Harvard and missing the point. Same MIT did and all these other areas. So um, I cannot believe I'm coming to the end of the conversation. And I feel like I have so many questions. I keep on talking, but I want to be cognizant of time. I want to ask the very last question, work-life balance. You know, you are a mother. I have a three-year-old and uh, running around with that, it's not easy. And uh, you are a mother. Uh, I mean, obviously you have a grown child right now, but all this process and journey, now you have different responsibilities um, than uh, running a toddler or a teenager. But I would love to know, how do you maintain your work-life balance? And uh, obviously all your chai sessions are also happening on the side. <laughs> and nature.org. Yes, um, you know, in my life, it's always been a myth in the sense that uh, to me, it has never been either or, it's always been an and function. It has always been work and life, life and work. And what I mean by that is, and as my girls, I have two girls, both of who are grown, my older one is 25, my younger one is 21, but mom duty never ends. No, my older no. one is getting married. She's getting engaged this weekend. Oh my means, God, congratulations. Yes. Oh Thank my you. God. Which means lots of stuff. And you yeah. know, it's going to be a fat Indian wedding uh, next yeah. year. So oh, lots Indian weddings are like, yeah, they're like, a, I had a one year wedding. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, the, the countdown starts now for us. And those are important things in life. You cannot compromise one for the other. Yeah. I always say I will be a terrible mother if I didn't work as hard as I did. And I would be terrible. I mean, I'd be a disgruntled worker if I didn't have my wonderful personal life and did you know, all the things that I do there. And what message at the end would I send to my daughters, right? Yeah. But I'll tell you, the one thing that helped me a lot in, in keeping that sanity, and this is where I go back to our cultural context, uh, my, both my parents and my in-laws have, have played a pivotal role in helping me raise my daughters. You know, they, they would take turns and then eventually they moved. My in-laws now have lived with me for 23 years. Wow. 
Yeah, and we a lot of people ask cultures. Yeah, yes, yeah, and a lot yeah. of people ask, how could you do that? You know what? Lots of leadership lessons right there, right? The ability to adjust and work as a team and give and take and, you know, all of that, uh, you know, you learn in the house and it's all for the greater good. We wanted to raise very, um, sort of have a stable household yes. where I could still go travel and not worry about the nanny showing up or not. But I am privileged as in, I, we were lucky that we had parents who could do that. Yes. yes. Right? But it was an investment for all of us to make that happen. So for me, I attribute that to my work-life balance is that privilege I had with parents and in-laws being able to take the time to, you know, and so ours is in some ways a joint family, if you will, right? My kids, when they did pictures, artwork in kindergarten and stuff, they always did this, you know, eight people um, artwork. And once my, uh, the, my older daughter's teacher called me because she was very perturbed by these drawings that my daughter was doing with so many people for family. And so she thought, you know, it was a broken family, perhaps uh, she wanted to make sure that my daughter you know, had um, had the comfort of a, a, a proper family. And then I had to explain to her, no, she has more people than she needs that is waiting on her hand and foot all the time. So yeah. she's not deprived by any means at <laughs> all. So, yeah, so to me, that is what defines my work-life balance. I have taken my kids on trips a lot with me. You know, um, I've taken my nannies before. I've taken my mother-in-law with me uh, uh, when I've gone on um, business trips. That's what worked for me. No, this is such a beautiful way of ending, um, you know, our conversation, and especially on this Asian American uh, Heritage Month, because this is so important because our culture plays a very important role from the very beginning that, you know, our parents are very strict, like make sure you get your education yes. and make sure, you know, nothing less matters. You know, you it has to be in a certain level, certain standard. And later on, they also come as a as someone who is also caretaking for us, even yes. when we are grown up with our children and everything. And that I think that culture stays with us in building a better community and also a very powerful career for us because when you have a stable home you can go and charge in the world you know? and I think that is so important so thank you so much Maithili for your time and I'm so glad that you were able to give me this time and